Recent research by CBRE estimates that the demand for cold storage buildings could increase by 100 million square feet in the next five years, at a time when less than 5 million square feet are currently under construction. Joining us today to discuss supply and demand in this burgeoning industri industrial subsector are Cameron Treffy, a principal, and Kate Lyle, a studio manager for industrial cold and food with the firm Ware Malcolm, which is a leader in this field. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's start off by talking a little bit about what kind of buildings we're referring to here and what's driving the demand for them. So that CB CBRE report that you mentioned was talking about cold storage buildings, but in particular, that number was focused upon uh, the growth that they were seeing in e-commerce. So mm -hmm. when they were looking at that uh, 100 million square feet, as I understand it, is they were looking at um, economic growth that was expected for e-commerce. And then they were uh, uh, tying that to how many square feet of uh, cold storage buildings are required to have that size of economy. And they extrapolated from there. It's not a perfect number because there's a couple things that go on with with cold storage. Um, one is older buildings are shorter and newer buildings are taller. So we're getting more economic output out of the same square footage. So that number might be a little bit lower in square footage, but it might be higher in cubic footage. Um, we're also seeing, um, you know, it's not just cold storage that and and e-commerce that's that's creating this surging demand um, for for cold buildings, as we call them, um, to encompass both the storage side of things, but also um, uh, the uh, the manufacturing side of buildings. So everywhere along the uh, the food supply chain, we're seeing this growing demand um, for co cold buildings, and that's driven by everything from you know the obviously e-commerce is a big one, but also you know recent events have created this this surge of demand where we want to do things a little less just in time. Um, mm -hmm. And we're wanting to hold a little bit more stock. So there's a, you know, we're seeing that across the industrial sector, including cold storage, where we're seeing, you know, more demand for, for a higher amount of stock being held. Um, and then, you know, we're also seeing things happening with the ports where um, a lot of uh, people who are importing products because of the recent challenges in the ports, they're looking at maybe we're going to different ports. So we might have, you know, a pretty good buildup in terms of, you know, our port of Long Beach cold storage, but suddenly Houston is where everyone wants to go. And so we have to build a lot of buildings in Houston. Um, and then the other thing is a lot of the buildings are aging out. So, um, you know, uh, something like 70% of cold storage buildings are over 20 years old. Um, and once you get to that age on a cold storage building, you're really looking at, you know, you're hitting the life cycle for your uh, initial investment in refrigeration systems. You're looking at changing out equipment and then you start to go, well, if I'm gonna make this investment in changing out equipment, what other changes can I make on my building? And so, um, you know, is this building still gonna work for me in my future or do I start to look at, at new buildings um, and uh, moving to a new building and then that older building might get a second tenant. Um, so there's this, you know, cycle um, in terms of, of the cold storage buildings um, and different tenants moving around uh, as as the times change. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's been it's, it's been stated that we're entering an era of speculative cold building, and it, but until now the sector's construction has been pretty cautious, pretty purpose built. What are the risks and rewards of this new era if it actually is here? Yeah, so um, as Kate mentioned, you know the, the reason behind speculative cold buildings actually um, coming to market is just the demand is, is sky high and um, speed to market for pool users and cold building users is, is usually hypercritical. Um, and so the market has uh, now you know, developed an appetite for speculative cold building. The, the risks are certainly greater, right? Because the cost of cold building construction um, is, you know, upwards of, of three times um, the cost of dry buildings. Um, so the, the risk that, that is out there is that you're stuck with a very expensive asset on your hands if you can't fill it up. Uh, but given the demand that is out there, uh, the reward is that 
the rents are significantly higher. Um, and typically terms are much longer for cold buildings. So where you might uh, have, have you know, traditional dry warehouse users looking for seven or 10 year terms, um, landlords are able, able to command um, higher terms based on the cost of construction for these buildings. So we typically see 15 and 20 year leases um, on cold buildings. And so that's incredibly attractive to the uh, institutional buyers that are out there. Um, so really, I think it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, your firm has developed a what's referring to as a cold-ready speculative prototype. Uh, can you provide some details about this and what makes it different? Yeah, so there's, there's a few things that are different. Um, we call it the cold-ready speculative building. Uh, there's a couple different ways to go about it. Um, the traditional cold building, build to is typically it looks like a big white box that's um, you know a refrigerated building um, that's built out of insulated metal panel uh, for the perimeter uh, building envelope and then the other version of this is what we call the box in the box and so you would build something that looks from the exterior more like a traditional dry warehouse building with precast or tilt up concrete um, on the exterior and then we would use liner panels on the inside to to get that thermal envelope and the insulation our values that are required for these buildings. Um, you know, we've successfully rolled this this uh, prototype out, and we've done a, a project down in Texas and Dallas that was actually the first speculative coal building uh, to come onto the market. Uh, while that building was under construction, it became fully leased, and so uh, shifted gears slightly and became a, a spec to suit, as we like to say. Um, and so that building is fully occupied, and then we're underway. Um, on another building in Miami, Florida, uh, called Bridgepoint. So that's another one. And then, you know, around the country, we're in design um, on anywhere from 15 to 20 of these buildings um, in various parts of the country. Um, demand is, is quite strong. Uh, I would say that demand, like demand for dry warehouses, varies by some market, um, but we're certainly seeing interest countrywide. Um, are there unique design and construction challenges to building cold as opposed to dry, dry for lack of a better term, uh, or uh, industrial facilities? I mean, can you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what, uh, what problems you had to solve in order to get this prototype off the ground? Right. So cold buildings are very different from dry buildings. Your need for continuity in both a thermal envelope and a vapor envelope is really, really critical for cold buildings. If you don't get that right, then you end up with a lot of challenges where water wants to get into the building and turn into ice. Um, water underneath your building might turn into ice and then you have ice under your slab. Um, you can have moisture getting into the building that's creating indoor rain. So there's all these challenges that you have to address when you're designing cold buildings. When we did the prototype, what we really looked at is what can we build into this building that's going to be fairly universal because these buildings can vary a lot, right? A cooler is different than a freezer, but what is going to work for our most challenging conditions? And how are we going to uh, design a building that's going to meet all those challenging conditions? So we look at things like what are the under slab conditions and how do we make that uh, designed so that we can have a, a full freezer sub slab system, which is a, a heating and an insulation and a vapor barrier system, um, making sure that's nice and continuous underneath the building so you don't get that ice under your slab, which can be a huge uh, damage creator, um, either heaving up slabs or if it melts, heaven forbid, your building might start sinking. Um, <laughs> so there's all of these things that can can happen with cold buildings that, um, you know, we, we try to create an envelope and a design that's going to make it easy for us to do the full detailing of the building and make it work really well for cold storage. Just out of curiosity, I, uh, this, this is beyond the questions that I sent you, but how, how large are these buildings generally? Are they bigger than a, than a conventional industrial plant or, 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 or are they smaller? What, what, what's the general dimension? Yeah, and I, I think I would say that they um, tend to be slightly smaller than the big box dry warehouses. We're not seeing speculative cold buildings in the million square foot range. Um, 
500,000 square feet is probably the high end of the range that we're seeing for speculative, and maybe that's just due to the cost of the buildings. But actually, when it comes to a user standpoint, um, there aren't that many users out there that need you know, a million square feet of cold storage. Uh, and if they do, uh, it's likely that they are they are searching for a building suit condition. Mm -hmm. um, so we are seeing that range anywhere from you know 150,000 square feet all the way up to 500. The sweet spot being somewhere between you know 250 and 350,000. Mm -hmm. We've also done smaller infill sites, which can go down to 50, 60,000 square feet. It's obviously higher cost, but in the right location, it might be a good uh, investment to do that small of a building. I just finished writing a story about data centers, and one of the big keywords among all the people I talked to was about how they need to be flexible and scalable. Um, and Cameron, you mentioned earlier about how the cost of these these buildings can be significantly higher than a dry industrial building. Um, tell me a little bit about how flexibility is a priority with these with the, with these kinds of cold buildings, and and how that's manifesting itself. I'd say that the biggest thing that we can do to create future flexibility for these buildings is verticality. Um, cold storage buildings, uh, it's hard to grow them outwards. It's hard to grow them um, horizontally and increase your square footage, um, both because you might want a site that's closer to people or closer to you know the, the consumer, but also because you're expanding refrigeration systems. And so you're having all these mechanical systems that have to get incrementally larger as you expand square footage. If you allow for growth and verticality, then you're not, you're able to use a lot of the same mechanical systems, a lot of the same refrigeration systems because of refrigeration cycles. So um, we really recommend that uh, uh, developers when we're doing speculative and even build to suit users really take into account that even if you're not going to use all of the cube that you build, down the line, you may want to put in a new racking system that's going to accommodate that extra height. And that's a great way to increase pallet positions um, in your building uh, without having that huge investment of expanding the square footage. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, what are, as, you, as you expand this, your prototype to other parts of the country, what are some of the key factors that need to be considered when you're delivering these types of buildings in different geographies? Well, obviously demand, right? So sure, yeah. um, make those sub market by sub market. So um, demand varies by what what sub market you're in. So if you're in a port location, you might be looking at a different type of cold prototype building or size, right? Uh, than you would be in an urban infill. Uh, type market, perhaps you're in close proximity to, um, you know, processing facilities, and so uh, you may want to be able to be demisable down to 50,000 square foot for tent sizes. So the tenant mix, I think, is something very important to consider. Uh, the base prototype that we've developed, you know, easily divides into two different tenants. Uh, we can expand that to three and up to, um, you know, five or six, depending on the, the site geometry. Um, as Kate mentioned you know, previously, the utilities, the refrigeration infrastructure, all of that eats up additional site area that you don't, um, you don't come across in the dry warehouse development. So that's also a consideration. Um, security is, is a high concern with mm. these things. And, and that is due to the fact that, that you know, if you're part of the cold chain, you're part of the, the, the food supply, you are um, also going to be um, subject to, you know, additional regulations, governmental regulations, and, and additional security requirements. So uh, it's, it's, it's critical that we think about that and truck queuing and, and all of those things when we're doing the site layouts for these buildings. Mm -hmm. Getting back to my question about what's driving the market, um, I've, I've noticed in other reports that the, 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 the capital markets have been responding to the, the, this particular subsector, I mean, are, am I am I reading my reading this right? Are investors showing more interest in this? Absolutely. Um, I think that there was a you know a vacuum there. There isn't a lot of competition in this particular market sector, um, and so folks that feel that they have the expertise uh, to take on this challenge uh, see this as a real opportunity. Right? It's a bit of a blue ocean environment, and that there isn't a lot of competition out there yet. Um, 
um, of course, you know, uh, that always changes, right? As the, the hot new topic uh, comes out, you, you tend to get people like to jump on the bandwagon. But truly, truly the, the experts that are able to deliver um, this successfully will survive and, you know, be better off for it. Um, so I, I really think that that was it, that there just was a void in the market uh, place for this type of development. Well, thank you both for taking a couple of minutes to talk to me about this. And I wish you good luck with your prototype as you expand it across the country. Thank, thank you, you so much. And uh, this is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction. Thanks for joining us.